Please be seated. Professor Anthony G. Reddy studied for his doctorate in education and practical theology at the University of Birmingham with Professor John Hull. If the name Professor John Hull is not familiar to you, please do look him up, and you might be interested in the film Notes on Blindness. He was a disability theology who I once had the privilege to meet, and very worth uh, exploring his work and his life. Professor Reddy's research interests are the meeting of black theology and decolonial and transformative education as a means of strengthening consciousness and empowerment. He's the author of many books, articles and chapters, including Theologizing Brexit, a Liberationist and Postcolonial Critique, and the republished Is God Colorblind? Insights from Black Theology for Christian Faith and Ministry. Professor Reddy is an A-rated leading international researcher with the South African National Research Foundation and the recipient of the Archbishop of Canterbury's 2020 Lafranc Award for exceptional and sustained contribution to black theology in Britain and beyond. He is, as I have mentioned, Professor of Black Theology at the University of Oxford and Director of the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture at Regent's Park College. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Anthony G. Reddy. So let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. It's wonderful to be with you. It's, it, it's wonderful to be with you this morning here in Radlett. I've never been here before. It's just been something I've seen on a map, and I think I may have driven round it. Probably got a train through it. Um, I mean, I've been to St Albans a few times, so I've probably been through it. But first time I've been here, and it's great to be with you. In many respects, my work in Oxford University is almost in two halves. I started in January, in January 2020, and my appointment was not heralded. I work in a very small college in Oxford, so for those of you who follow football, if you imagine that Oxford colleges are a bit like the Premier League, then I'm in a college that's the equivalent of Southampton. <laughs> so it's kind of near the bottom, we're not kind of making any great waves, it's nothing special. It's, it's in Oxford, but compared to the bigger ones that the equivalent of Manchester City and, and Arsenal or whatever, it's small fry. Then something amazing happens, which is 7th of September last year, I am made a full professor. First of its kind in 900 years. And suddenly I become somebody. The day before, I was largely anonymous, the next day, I had the BBC ringing me. And there were interviews all over the place, and suddenly people are interested in my testimony. Our theme for the sermon taken from the reading from the Gospel is testimony. The power of telling our story. So I must to tell my story, and all of a sudden, I'm aware of that weird thing of I've worked for 25 years to become an overnight success. And suddenly everyone now wants to hear about Anthony George Reddy. And so I tell my story. And one of the questions that often gets asked of me is, well, how does one become a black theologian? How does that happen? And for me, there are lots of theories I could give, but there's one specific moment when I know something happened in my consciousness. I was 11 years old. And the Methodist Conference, I'm a Methodist, which meets every year, so that's the supreme 
governing body of the church. We meet in a different place every year. I was born in Bradford, West Yorkshire. This is a Yorkshire accent, although I've lived for 40 years in Birmingham. It's often said you can take the man out of Yorkshire, but you can't take Yorkshire out of the man. So, I was born in God's own city of Bradford, West Yorkshire. And the Methodist Conference in 1978 came to Bradford and specifically came to my church. So basically, like the great and the good are uh, the great and the good of our denomination, plus all the civic leaders of the city, plus many other, I guess, many other representatives from churches all over the world who are Methodists, all descended on this small industrial city called Bradford. And so, our superintendent minister called for volunteers to help clean the church in readiness for all these dignitaries to come. And my mother, of blessed memory, she died 10 years ago in February, she volunteered all of us in the family. I mean, she didn't ask us, she just volunteered us. And so for about three months, my family and I, we went down three days a week to clean the church. And we polished and cleaned and polished and cleaned. I still have a relationship with Brasso <laughs> that will haunt me for the rest of my life. That if it was bronze or gold, we, sh we shot it till we could see our faces. So from January through to April, we cleaned the church. Come the end of June, first week of July, that's when conference normally happens, we had a big ceremony to open the conference at which the Lord Mayor was invited and all the city dignitaries, people from across the county, so including the local MPs, president of the conference, all the dignitaries turned up. Representatives from Methodist churches all over the world turned up. My family was not invited. We were good enough to clean the church, but not good enough to be invited when all the civic ceremonies and all the important people turned up. We heard about the service and we heard what a wonderful occasion it was from people who felt not embarrassed to tell us how wonderful it was when we were not there. And at the time, in my very early age, I began to think, but why did they not invite us? And of course, in that very English way, no one was rude or abrasive. They just, just felt that it wasn't our kind of thing. What really angered me at the time, which I feel embarrassed about now, was I was more angry with my mother because she wasn't angry. I was very angry. And my sons were angry. Because we thought to ourselves, but like, we cleaned the church more than anyone else did. Actually, most of the dignitaries in the church who turned up were ones who never turned up once to clean. Yet, um, yet my family, courtesy of my mother, had all of us down three days a week for three months. So I remember turning to my mother and saying, but mom, why are you not upset? Because clearly we should have been there. And my mom said, but honey, we cleaned the church because we were doing it for Jesus. Yes, I would have liked to have been there, but it's not important. It's important that you do what you can to serve the Lord, and if others recognize it, it's great, but if they don't, then so be it. And it's at that moment something happened in my consciousness, because I thought to myself, so this was a church full of nice people. Let, let me not be unduly cruel on them. They were generous people. Part of who I am was from the Sunday school teachers, the ministers, the leaders of the church who gave me a sense of being somebody, so I owe them a great deal, and yet, and yet, there was still a kind of polite racism that said that all of us are equal, but in that infamous dictum from Animal Farm, some are more equal than others, and so some deserve to turn up, and my family were not invited. What exacerbated was that years later when I began to write as a theologian and I was invited to turn up to significant events and people would ask me, so tell us something of your work, Dr. Rady. Why do you do the work you do? I would share the story. 
I would give my testimony. And then what would happen, people will say, but are you sure that happened? And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that we were not invited yet. Because I have no recollection of ever being in that service. And they said, yes, but are you sure that the invite wasn't sent but got lost in the post? No, because no one else were given invites in the post. We were in the church every Sunday. If we were not in church, it's because we were sick. We were in church every single week. People were always trying to find some polite reason to explain away what was very obvious, which was a polite kind of middle-class genteel racism. Not N-words, not racial epithets, not anything abusive, just that quiet way in which English people, often overseen by class as well, have a very careful way of calibrating who deserves to be here and to be seen and listened to and who isn't. And that stayed with me. I've just gone 60 years old. And what I notice now, of course, being a full professor in Oxford University, is everyone is happy to hear my story. Now, people are happy to hear my testimony. But there was a time when people were not interested in what my family or that generation of the Windrush generation had to say for themselves. In our Gospel passage, Jesus talks about having a testimony that people do not believe. Jesus reminds his first hearers that for a while John the Baptist came and gave testimony and for a while it was convenient to hear him but once he became difficult as prophets invariably are, once he began to make people feel uncomfortable, suddenly they stopped listening to him. And eventually he's executed. And so Jesus says, actually, I have a testimony. I have a testimony that I have come to represent God, to show you God and people do not believe him. Why I suspect to do with the fact that he's not a Pharisee, he's not a Sadducee, he's not from the particular class of people for whom you would expect to hear from God, he comes from Nazareth. And then elsewhere in the Gospel, there was a prominent person who says, can anything good come from Nazareth? So Jesus comes to testify, and he's not listened to, he is not believed. In many respects, that is almost a microcosm for what's happened certainly to that Windows generation. To be clear, not so much my generation, which is not to say that racism still does not continue, but I'm aware that in my own life I've achieved a relatively form of status that gives me a prominence that people are more likely to hear my testimony. But when I talk to aunts and uncles, and I talk to that older generation of people who came to remind you they came as British subjects. I still have my father's blue passport, my mother's blue passport, when they came as British subjects from Jamaica in 1957 and 1959, respectively. And they came to do the jobs that English and British people did not want to do after the hardships of World War II, of having defeated Hitler's fascism. Our economies always need people who will do the entry-level jobs that the people who have established here do not want to do. That is always a fact. Still is a fact. If you want to see the truth of that, then simply go into the city and see who's coming out of offices having done the cleaning all night, and they're invariably not white faces. So that generation comes at the invitation of the British state to do jobs that no one else wants to do and they face hardship and struggle. But what is worse is not so much the hardship and struggle they face is that when they tell their story, when they tell their testimony, it's invariably not believed. Often because it's coming from the wrong type of body, maybe the wrong colour and certainly the wrong class, for us to believe what they're saying may have something to tell us about God and something to tell us about fortitude and struggle and hard work.
In the passage, Jesus reminds his first hearers that it's perfectly possible to scour the scriptures, to read and to be diligent and still miss the point. It's still possible to be faithful, you believe in one's own certainty of who God is and to practice that within community. And yet be faced with individuals who don't look like you and somehow not see God present in them, not to see their testimony of the stories that they're telling that are indicative of our collective way of being a nation. Part of what I've been committed to doing my work is to tell the stories of those who have often been overlooked and ignored. I'm thinking of of an older man called Gerald who came from Barbados in 1955 to Britain as a British subject. For those who want to know, Barbados did not become independent until 1966, so he came and was British. And then somewhere along the line, various governments changed the Nationality Act that then changed his nationality from British to Bayesian even though he had never returned to Barbados and had spent all his life working in this country, paid his taxes, paid his national insurance, brought up his children, contributed to British society, worked for over 40 years on London transport. And then found himself deported because suddenly he wasn't British anymore. And yes, we have a compensation scheme that will help to restore people who have gone through that privation, but it can't help Gerald because he died in Jamaica. Having been brought back to a country he had not been in for over 50 years, and landed back with no family, and all the people he had known had long gone because he had made his life here, he died of a massive heart attack. No compensation will help him. Perhaps the worst indictment, as I preach here on this Sunday in Black History Month, is that when polls have been taken about the often negative attitude we have to foreigners, to immigrants, to people who we think shouldn't be here, if I'm honest with you, the biggest indictment is that the social attitudes of people who go to church are not that different from the ones who don't. So all these years of reading the scriptures, as Jesus says in the text, all these years of reading the scriptures, all these years of being faithful to God, and somehow our views are no different from people who, who never cross the threshold of a church at all. I want to leave three thoughts with us on this Black History Month. Testimony matters. First, it's to hear the stories of those who are often invisible in our society. What is their story? What do they have to tell us about ourselves and about their own struggles? Every person who is often reviled in the press as a migrant, as someone who shouldn't be here, has a story. And the courage to listen to the stories that perhaps we don't want to hear, or the ones that might tell us the inconvenient truth, is precisely why we should listen to them. Because in the midst of that story, we will hear something of God's presence. So do we have the courage to hear stories of people, not just of people like myself, very easy to invite me, and don't get me wrong, I love being here. You may not love me being here, but I certainly love being here. Thank you for the invitation. But it's easy to invite Professor Anthony Reddy because, you know, there's a kind of respectability that I've achieved that means that when I come and tell my story, it makes us all feel good because isn't it wonderful that someone like Anthony can become a professor? But my mom lived here for 
for 34 years. And if I live to be 100, I will never be the person she was. And yet, her story has largely been invisible and unknown. And when she told her story of her struggle in Britain, she was largely not believed. So we have to have the courage to hear the stories of those who are on the margins and often invisible. And then secondly, it's the courage to accept that in those stories we will hear things that we have not heard before and they will challenge us. It is often said that the true measure of a society is not how we praise those who are at the top, it's how we look after those at the bottom. One of my favourite writers is a Cuban-American scholar called Miguel de la Toro, who is interesting because he's one of those few Cuban-Americans who's not very right-wing, he's actually quite left-wing. And Miguel says this, he says, in most of our societies, we praise upwards but blame downwards. We praise upwards, so when things are going well, it's our fearless leaders and entrepreneurs, it's the people who are making money, we give them thanks. When it's going wrong, it's the migrants, it's the immigrants. It's the, it's the poor people, it's austerity therefore to punish them, which is a way of making the rest of us who are middle class somehow feel better. We praise upwards, blame downwards. As a church, we are repeatedly told in our scriptures that God loves everyone, but God has a preferential option, a special relationship for those who are told that they don't matter, and those on the margins. For us to be authentic church and what we need to realise when we read this text and other texts is that when Jesus says that I have come and I bear witness and people don't believe me then actually that is often how we have continued with others who have borne witness to God's presence but in the wrong body or in the wrong class speaking the wrong accent and suddenly they're not believed, they're not seen. But finally, it's, it's also to recognise the fact that in the midst of all of that, what we also have is the capacity to change because within the context of our faith, we talk about metanoia, we talk about turning around, we talk about repenting, we talk about learning from all that we have done before and been better tomorrow. Shortly, we will celebrate the Eucharist. And as we celebrate the Eucharist, we celebrate that God's presence here, God's grace, allows us to be different, allows us to be better, allows us to learn from the past and to be better in the future. On this Black History Month, as I come as someone who has achieved a very celebrated position for which my family is enormously proud, my dad who is still alive, Actually, not a day goes by when he's not telling all his neighbours about his son who's become a professor. I mean, I, I love my dad, but it's a kind of embarrassment. It's like, okay, dad, you know. And you can dull it down just a little bit. And he's like, no, I, I can, but I do not want to. I want to tell everybody about my son. So, of course, I'm proud that he's proud. But I also want to remember in this position I have all those years ago when it felt like to suddenly be told that you are good enough to clean but not good enough to turn up and see important dignitaries. If I live to be 100 I will never forget that feeling and my work for as long as I'm able to do it is to give dignity to those people who are told that they don't matter. It's to give dignity to the people who are told that they're troublesome and yet the truth is they're doing the jobs that most of us in this room would never want to do. And yet if it wasn't done then the society and our economy would struggle. It's a recognition of that Windrush generation and their successes that we have not been a problem to society, we've been a gift. The three biggest institutions that have been blessed by black people in this country have been London Transport, the NHS, and the church. As I sit and look at your sometimes bewildered faces, thinking, okay, so when is he going to finish? Honestly, I'm finishing very soon. 
almost finished. But as I look at your faces, I see evidence of that same form of migration that has enriched our church all over the country. Our churches are measurably better because all those mission fields that happened in the empire, all those bits in pink on the globe, have actually come back. <clears throat> mission has come home. People have come back and they have served their church, served their Lord in Christ faithfully. Our job is to be faithful to them as they have been faithful to us. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.